Um, welcome to the second night of the um, three-part series of the Direct Marketing Sheep and Goat webinar series. Um, the series is being co-hosted by the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development, um, who I'm with, and the Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office. And we've got um, Kelly, who will um, tell you about um, them in a minute. But we're offering this series for a couple reasons. Um, the first reason is to help um, launch and get the word out about um, website resources that Sheep and Goat Development Office have put together online, and there'll be more about that at the end. And then the second reason is, um, you know, this year there's been a real response um, to the increase in interest in raising animals for meat in Kentucky, um, which was kind of spurred on by the pandemic, as I'm sure most of you know. With that, I'll go to the second slide. All right, so I'm Kelly Yates. I'm the executive director for the Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office. And I just wanna give you a little bit of background on us in case you're not familiar with us. We are an independent nonprofit, started in 2007. And our main efforts are to provide education, promotion, and marketing assistance to small remnant producers. We also serve as the umbrella for the Kentucky Goat Producers and the Kentucky Sheep and Wool Producers Associations. Those two associations make up our main board and help us determine the initiatives and efforts that we need to do for the small remnant industry. And then, so there's benefits of being part of our group, either one of those associations in our office, mainly by pulling the sheep and goat folks together, it gives us a bigger voice. So we have the ability to make ourselves known amongst legislators and the heavy hitters in the ag industry that can help us move forward with better initiatives. And then if you're a member of an association, you get more specific benefits like our management calendar, which we talked a lot about last night because it's so good, it's got resources in it and you get breeder directory listings and, and several things, but you can go to our website, it's ksheepandgoat.org and click on the association tab and you can find out all of the benefits that you get from being a member in one of those associations. Great, and um, the Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development is also an independent nonprofit that was established in 2001. Um, our main purpose is to assist farm businesses with, um, you know, planning and development, and um, we can also help with, you know, marketing plans. Um, we also do feasibility. We help analyze feasibility of new ventures or ideas, and we can also assist businesses in determining what loans or grants might be good fits for their um, farm businesses. Most of these services are at no cost to the producer due to support from the um, Kentucky Agricultural Development Board, USDA, and other partners. Uh, we do this work uh, during <laughs> non-COVID times through, you know, in-person one-on-one meetings, workshops, and trainings. We have moved to virtual work, um, obviously, in this season. Um, so that's a little bit about us. You'll hear more about um, us from my colleague Brent Lackey tonight. And um, just a few details before we really get started so that you guys know how to participate in the webinar tonight. Um, all of the attendees, you are muted and your video is off. We encourage you to um, submit questions and comments in the Q&A box. Your chat um, should be turned off. Um, so we really want you to use that Q&A box. And if you leave this webinar series with any unanswered questions, we really encourage you to reach out to um, the organizations represented here. We would love to help. Um, and we will re be recording all of the webinars. It'll take us a minute to get those edited and online, but we hope to send out the email with those links next week to everyone. So if you have to miss a night, you can um, catch that later. And um, Kelly, if you wanna go over the agenda. Sure. So last night we talked about the production of sheep and goats for direct marketing. So tonight we're going to talk about processing. So really excited to have these folks on board. Dr. Greg Renfro from the University of Kentucky is going to talk about processing meat. And then Sarah Beth Perido in our office with the Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office. She's our fiber director, marker guru. She's going to talk about processing fiber. 
And then Brent Lackey from KCARD is going to talk about meat and fiber market business planning. Um, and that will wrap up tonight. We might go over a few minutes because, you know, it's us and we're pretty typical of doing that <laughs> in the sheep and goat world. So, um, but hopefully it's all good and you hang in there. And then tomorrow night, we're going to talk about sales opportunities. So you want to make sure you don't miss that either. Thanks. And last slide before we dive in, just a little note about who's participating tonight. Uh, a quarter of you have been raising sheep or goat for more than 10 years. A third of you have been raising sheep or goat for one to five years. And the rest of you are really split between uh, not at all, less than a year, or five to 10 years. Um, and then 53% of you, about half of you, do not currently sell sheep or goat meat or fiber into a local or regional market. So expect that there's a lot of um, people attending tonight who would either like to learn how to do that or, you know, start that for the first time. Or if you already do that to improve your um, current marketing channels and um, tactics. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Renfro now and we'll get started with your presentation. All right. Well, I guess it's up to me. Um, I guess I just tell you when to advance, I assume, Olivia. Okay, we can do that. Uh, it's good to be here this evening. Um, I'm down in my basement. Usually I do these from my office, but my wife had some things for me to do this afternoon, so I thought I'd do it in my basement. Got to have a virtual background because I found out that uh, I did a TV segment for a local uh, news channel, and in my basement, I'm a big St. Louis Cardinals fan. I grew up about an hour outside of St. Louis, and so I've got all those banners behind me, and I did this thing for TV and they got all these emails afterwards saying, how can you work for University of Kentucky and be a Louisville Cardinal fan? I said, it's a St. Louis Cardinal. So got to have the virtual background there. So next slide, if you would. All right, well, there we go. Um, I will say one thing. I don't think it. Uh, we have to go very far in, in, in saying that this is a weird year. Uh, it's an odd year. And, and it started out, you know, we tipped our glasses and said a cheer there at, uh, you know, the New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, never realizing that by the time we, we would uh, say goodbye to 2020, that we would not only look at a global pandemic, a uh, a social revolution and everything else. Uh, but COVID-19 is a reality. This afternoon, we heard the uh, the governor, if you're watching any of your local news channels, talking about uh, the third spike that we are having, which seems to be an even uh, greater spike than we've had before, and the new regulations coming down uh, as far as, uh, as, as he said, a, a surgical uh regulations that he's, he's putting in place to kind of get this uh, third spike under control. And now all of a sudden we're starting to see glimmers of this happening. Uh, are we experiencing more shortages? Um, I can tell you from a national standpoint, from the, from the meats industry, the industry as a whole, whether it's the beef, pork, or even the lamb industry, even the poultry industry, uh, they've done a really good job after the initial spike that we had back in March, April, and May uh, of uh, putting things together and putting things in place to where they can physical distance people and they can get them into the plant and now hopefully kind of control the, the spread of the virus in those plants. So I, I haven't seen anything from a national standpoint that we're headed towards another kind of hiccup as we would as we had back in in, uh, in April and May from a, from a meat standpoint. Uh, but I, I did hear on the news this morning that Walmart is starting to, to get another shortage of toilet paper and uh, haven't really paid attention in the, the shops that I, I uh, go to to see whether or not that's happening. But um, I think we're okay, you know, as far as that kind of stuff goes. But it did allow for a new avenue for people to get their, their supply of meat. And so they started looking locally and local meat processors were able to somewhat fill that void of trying to supply meat to the general public. 
The challenge of it is, is they're just small, local, sometimes family-owned businesses, and they quickly got overwhelmed. Then they became to where we were oversaturated in our in our processing throughout the state to where at one point in, uh, in May, I was talking to a processor and he said, I'm already taking bookings in October. So he was already, you know, he's booking ahead to October, 2020. And the next time I talked to him, he was in 2021 and even people saying 2022. And so you start to do the math on all of these, even if it's cattle, some of these animals haven't even been born yet that have reservations. And so we did get a little carried away, but the one good thing is the, the Kentucky uh, Department of Ag, GOAP, Governor's Office of Ag, Poly, K uh, Ag Policy, KCARD, and, and some of us at UK are working on ways to help our processors expand. Uh, the CARES money has come into effect for our meat processors so they can buy new technology to hopefully start to open up those some, some more spots. And so we're working on expanding our processing in the state as well. Next slide. So we're really working hard on that kind of stuff. But if you are considering this, uh, uh, doing your own direct marketing, like we see a lot of folks uh, interested in doing, there's some things we gotta talk about from a law standpoint and there's times I think where everybody should know this, but uh, I run into situations where folks don't quite uh, understand this. But in order for us to legally sell a piece of meat in this country, it has to be inspected by the government first. This is something that's been in place since 1906. And so this was the Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906 that mandated that we must have uh, inspection in place to ensure the wholesomeness of what we're selling. And so we cannot sell anything that's not been inspected first. I can tell you right now, somebody's going to ask, but I only do two or three animals a year. You still have to be inspected. There's really no exceptions to this, no matter how big or how small you are. The one thing I do want you to think about when you go to talk to your processor is make sure that every area of the plant is inspected. For example, It'll first get its initial inspection legend. That's the uh, the stamp you see there in the uh, in the cartoons. Is during the slaughter process. Then, if we cut it up, that part's got to be inspected. If you have it ground, that part has to be inspected. We have had situations where folks asked if they're inspected. The slaughter got inspected, but the cutting up wasn't inspected. So, if you're going to sell this, every avenue has to be inspected. You need to be. Uh, able to sit down and talk with your processor, processor because his inspection legend is going to have to go on those packages as well. So the take home message from this slide is if you're getting into this, you're going to have to make sure you're working with a USDA inspector processor. Uh, you're, there's no exceptions to this whatsoever. Even if you're doing one or two animals a year, you still have to be inspected. Next slide. There we go. So once you make that decision, once you realize you're going to have to find a USDA meat processor, I understand location is always going to be a consideration. You're always going to look for that processor that's close to you. That is, you know, by far the, the biggest challenge that folks have is trying to find somebody local that they can work with. Things that you need to understand when you go work with a processor, and it doesn't matter who it is. I, I threw up Trackside here because uh, they're kind of centrally located to everybody as well. There's a few others, Boone's Butcher Shop, uh, Marksbury, uh, a few others as well. Um, but uh, it, it's one of those things that when you decide to do this, you need to sit down with the uh, meat processor, let him know what you're doing. All right. He needs to know that this is your goals. And you got to ask yourself certain things. Is he willing to work with you? Are you willing to work with him? He's going to be the guy that kind of guides you through this process to make sure we're doing things correctly. And there's some other things that you need to do as well. Uh, if they have a retail meat case, I would look at that, you know, because that is something that you need to pay attention to because that's going to be representative of the quality of products you're going to get back from from that processor when you go to take that to the farmer's market or the roadside stand, or you're going to do this off the farm as well. 
you so you need to pay attention if they got a, a, a retail case because that's going to be what you're going to get. I realize meat processing facilities have a smell. It's a it's a smell that I haven't experienced in thirty some odd years because I'm just used to it. But I realize that when I see the face on my students when they first go into the meat lab, it has that smell. That's a normal smell, but it shouldn't have that pungent smell to it that kind of rotting smell or anything like that it should have that typical meat processor smell even if it smells like bleach I, I i got a call from somebody one time that said i didn't like that processor processor i went in there it smelled like bleach that's a good thing all right that means it's they're cleaning they're sanitizing and stuff like that so just because it has that kind of sanitizer bleachy smell is not a bad thing because that just shows that they're very cognizant of food safety and of cleaning as well. I don't care how things go or how good you want things to be, things are going to go wrong. There's gonna be a situation where things are gonna happen where you're not gonna get what you wanted or you didn't get what you thought you were gonna get. And so this is where you need to have that relationship with your processor so that, um, so that you can sit down with him and discuss these type of things. So you can make sure that when things do go wrong, that you have that open relationship. Because I can tell you right now, I understand this is a free market system, all right? And so people get fed up and they say, I'm a switch meat processor. When you do that, uh, you got to realize you're almost starting from the first square. You're from day one, uh, you know, you're doing this all over again is now you got to reestablish that uh, that conversation with the new meat process. You got to go through this whole system once again. So if something does go wrong, I encourage you to have an open mind, sit down with the processor and say, okay, what do we need to do to fix this? This is where I'm unhappy. And he'll tell you, you know, where he's unhappy. This the relationship needs to work kind of like a marriage. If it cannot work, then that's when you switch meat processes. But realize that I just don't really uh, suggest people switch meat processors on a moment's notice without going through this good old fashioned, as, as Tony Soprano would say, a sit down, so to speak, so we can get things worked out. Um, the other thing you got to realize, too, is uh, especially nowadays, booking animals is going to be a challenge. So this is something you're going to have to kind of plan ahead. And, you know, if you're going to go down this avenue of direct marketing, you need to make sure that you're able to, uh, to book your animals. And he may say, okay, if you're going to do this, I need a guarantee from you that you're going to deliver me two animals every other month or something like that so that he can keep you on the schedule. So that's another thing you need to discuss with your processor is how this booking of animals is going to go. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. This has to be an open relationship. Next slide. I think we got a little bit of a lag there. There we go. So packaging, you know, so the next thing that the inspector is going to have is usually they're going to have a cut sheet and you're going to be able to choose the cuts you want. All right. And if you don't understand what's on that cut sheet, you don't understand what the processor is getting at. It's as much your responsibility as that he is as it is his to make sure that you're communicating. And sometimes I liking meat, talking with meat processors about like talking to my IT guy. My IT guy comes in to fix my computer. He's speaking English, but I don't understand what he's saying. All right. And that's a very common thing with IT guys. And, and, yeah, and it's my responsibility to say, Kevin, I don't understand what you're doing. As much as it is, is, is his responsibility to say, okay, this is what this means and this is why I'm doing this, all right? And it's the same thing with meat processors. We realize that sometimes we say things that we think you understand. And if you just stand there and shake your head, we pretty much take that as you understand what I'm saying. So if you don't understand, please ask questions, all right? And they don't feel embarrassed by asking questions about what it means when he says, oh, you're going to yield about this. What does that yield mean? Okay, just make sure you're, you're asking those questions. He's going to ask for, you know, what how you want your uh, your products to be packaged, all right? There's several different styles of packaging. I would encourage you to go with vacuum packaging. And the reason being is, just because you're selling somebody, let's say you're selling them a whole lamb carcass, all right? 
or a whole goat carcass or something along those lines, just because you're selling them a whole carcass doesn't necessarily mean they're going to eat that in a timely fashion. They may throw that in their freezer and they expect the very last package to come out of that freezer, whether that be two months after they bought it or six months after they bought that uh, product off of you. They want it to taste just like it did the very first day. And when we get into these extended freezer periods, we have run a risk of freezer burn. And um, I think a lot of us have, have uh, experienced freezer burn, the flavor, that kind of cardboard painty flavor, especially when you find that uh, uh, pint of ice cream that you forgot about in the back of the refrigerator. It's a little fuzzy there, but it's ice cream, so I'm going to eat it anyway. You know, that's freezer burn. That's freezer burn. So if you do the vacuum packaging, you remove one of the culprits, and that's air. And so you you get a longer time spent inside your freezer where you have a more representative flavor after six months as you did in the first month. The challenge of vacuum packaging is we remove the oxygen so the, the package doesn't bloom like you would want it to. So the color of the meat's gonna be a little bit darker. That's where you need to communicate with your consumers as well as to say, okay, this is what's going on, all right? And this is why it appears to be a little bit darker. It's because it's vacuum packaged. You remove the air. It's going to last a lot longer in your freezer. It's going to help prevent freezer burn. That communication with your consumers is just as important as the communication with your processors as well. Labeling. You know, uh, chances are you're going to have to have a label on there, especially if you're going to the farmer's market. They can be pretty simple as species, wholesale cut, retail name. It has to have a safe handling label on there. And it's going to have that inspection legend on there. All right. That's what we call a generic label. That's what you see in your grocery stores. Those are generic labels. Be very, very careful making claims, all right? Uh, for example, um, you know, if you're saying that our, our, and I'm just throwing this out here as a weird example because I've heard this before, um, our, our sheep are limited greenhouse gas emission sheep, all right? I've actually heard that in cattle before. And so if you make that claim, you may get by with it in a small market, but if somebody's going to challenge you on that, and you don't want to have to sit there with USDA and the labels and standards people that are trying to ask, uh, answer that question, why you put that on there. So be careful when you make those claims. A big one is hormone-free, you know, and we have this in the beef industry a lot. It's hormone-free. No, it's not hormone-free. Well, I don't use any growth hormones. You're not using growth hormones, but it still has hormones, okay? They have naturally occurring hormones. So be very careful when you make those claims. That's where that relationship with that meat processor is going to be so key, all right? Uh, peddling your wares, farmer's markets, roadside stands work really well, but that requires a lot of work. Uh, you know, every Saturday morning, you're setting things up. Uh, if you're doing goats, um, I would encourage you to sit down with the uh, ethnic or religious holiday calendar and understand at certain times of the year, they want a certain size of goat, certain type of goat. They want a certain sex of goat. And if you're going for some of those religious markets, especially in the, the uh, Islamic market, you're going to have to have that religious slaughter in there as well. I mean, you'll have to work with a processor and that be that adds an extra layer of difficulty is finding a processor that's able to do that religious slaughter. Not all of them will do that. Not all of them that have that exemption in there. I always get this a lot of times. Well, I want to go with it, selling Kroger, all right? Selling in Kroger and selling in restaurants, and I throw Kroger out there just as an example. Number one, grocery stores require this GFSI certification, Global Food Safety Initiative, all right? That goes a little bit above and beyond uh, USDA inspection. So grocery stores are a challenge. Restaurants are a challenge as well because both are the same thing. You need to be able to supply their demand, all right? So you may just be doing a couple of lambs a year or a couple of goats a year. Restaurants may not be that way. However, maybe you could have a night at the restaurant. I, you know, I'm using uh, Chef Weta Michaels as an example. At her restaurant, she'll have one night where she dedicates, our weekend she dedicates to this product. So you need to, to be uh, aware of that kind of stuff as well. Education, you got to realize that uh, most of your consumer base may or may not have had lamb or goat before. And so they may be looking to you for guidance. They, you know, what is the proper way to cook this? You know, 
what should I be looking for when I cook this? Cook this. What sides go with this as well? So education needs to be there as well. Okay. Next slide. So basically, we run into this a lot of times when, we, especially with the local products, people want to hear your story. That that's the big selling point. Uh, you're really just selling your story. And so be able to tell your story. If you have a little pamphlet that goes with it, tell your story. People want to know that this is a family farm. They want to know your kids are involved in FFA and 4-H. This is part of their projects. They want to know that kind of stuff. That is something that they, they really value is they want to be able, when they sit down and have dinner with their friends, to be able to pass that story on to their friends. What you're having tonight came from this farm and it's a family farm. People get into that kind of stuff. And also folks, be familiar with the industry as a whole, all right? People out there, consumers out there, they trust what you say, all right? They trust you more so than they trust those of us in, in academia or in science, all right? They trust you. The other people they trust are the, the folks that are against us, the PETAs, the the uh, HSUS of the world. So you need to be cognizant of that kind of stuff and be able to tell and talk about the industry as a whole. And it doesn't always hurt to have a recipe as well. And so with that, I believe that might be my last slide other than kind of paying homage. I thought this was really good, cool on uh, Saturday when we lost uh, Coach Schlarman. Um, you know, he's you know, lost a member of the UK family. And so I always thought that was kind of cool there. What questions do we have? I'm going to try to pull up my chat function to kind of help out as well. Do we have a list of USDA processes? We sure do. Uh, you can either contact me or you can contact the folks at KCARD. Uh, we, we share those files back and forth, and we're, we're in the process of trying to update those as well. Uh, oddly enough, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, our, uh, our dear uh extension specialist over in forestry and he's gone through and put it put out a list of deer processors so we can do that um next question if your processor orders labels for you for which you pay if you leave that at the pro if you leave that processor you can take the labels with you and use them at another processing plant chances are probably not because it has that processors inspection legend on there all right that's one thing i kind of left out there is when you order the labels, the processor has to keep those, okay? They can't go with you. Um, he has to keep those. Uh, other question I want to know, I, I know I want to stay in out of state process. Oh, things jump around, I'm sorry. Uh, stay in our state processing, but uh, with over the we're booking right now what about surrounding states again if you're going to go surrounding states you got to make sure they're usda especially go up into ohio indiana missouri illinois they have state inspection programs whereas us and tennessee we do not have a state inspection program so if you're going over the border to get your animals processed it has to be usda because if they're state processed they can't be sold across state lines but the challenge is is Talking with my colleagues around the country, their states are booked up as well. So, um, so it is a challenge to get processing right now. I will say that I, I bragged on us as a whole, uh, as you know, working hard to help our processors uh, identify their where they need to expand processing, and so we're working with them as a whole. But other other states are doing that as well. With that, I guess we're done. Uh, what if the closest process of opening is border in Canada? Uh, that's going to be a challenge because unless they're clear to, to, uh, cross, uh, cross lines, they know, you know, usually if we bring in things to, uh, um, uh, from overseas, it has to be an agreement with the USDA. So yeah, I would not encourage you to go overseas to Canada and think you can bring it back over us for sales. Kind of like a state inspector processor as well. All right, Olivia, I guess they're back to you. Thanks, Dr. Enfro. You bet. Yeah, that was great. And if if other people have more questions about processing, you can keep dropping them in there. Um, he is able to type answers. So um, we'll just keep moving on um, to Sarah Beth next. 
Thank you. All right. Um, so one of the main questions we get asked a lot at the office is, what is my wool worth? Um, we get asked that quite a lot. Um, people want to know, okay, so I've shorn it off. Now what do I do with it and how much can I get for it? Um, so we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, most wool sheep have to be sheared like you might have already found out once a year at least. Some long wool sheep have to be harvested twice um, just because um, the wool can get matted, it can get dirty. Um, some of the, the care and needs of a sheep with locks um, would take a little bit more care and might need to have two cuttings on. Um, some breeds, um, you hit typically hear merino sheep. We don't have a lot of merino sheep here in Kentucky. Our, our climate is not great on the merino sheep, um, but that's one of those breeds that you hear. You see merino wool socks when you go uh, to Cabela's, and those are the ones that you want to go grab because they're so soft and they feel unlike what you typically think of wool feeling like. So, um, but those are not the only high value fleeces and all wool is valuable. And so we wanna talk about that tonight. So um, there are four main types. Now, please know that this does not cover everybody, um, but there are four main wool types. So you got your fine wools, you got your long wools, your down wools and double coated. So those double coated sheep, um, will typically have hair in it um, and will have like an outer and an inner coat um, and a lot of that time has to be separated out um, sometimes with some of those breeds. Um, but some of the things we that that does not also even include a lot of those are, are purebred um, breeds that we're talking about there that does not include the good cross sheep. We are not going to count a cross sheep out. We like our mutt sheep. Um, those can still produce a really great fiber and a really great fleece, and we don't want to count those out. Um, so outside of breeder preference, there are some things um, in the next slide um, that can affect your wool's worth. Um, your fiber diameter, your crimp, your yield, your color, staple length, and fiber strength. And so um, those can all determine the value that you get out of your wool. And those can also be different year to year and on the age of your animal. So we're going to talk a little bit about each one. Uh, fiber diameter or the fineness is the actual measurement of the thickness of the strand of fiber. So if you pulled your own hair and you looked and said some people have coarse hair and some people have fine hair. Same kind of thing when we're, talk when we're talking about wool. That diameter of the actual um, individual strand of wool measures the, um, the fineness. It's measured in microns, um, which is one millionth of a meter. The diameter of the fiber determines the thickness the yarns can be made out of it easily. So smaller diameter wools, 22 microns or less. That's going to be your merinos, your rambolets, that's going to be uh, cormo, some of those really thin, um, really thin fibers, really fine fibers. Those can be made easily into finer yarns. Those are going to be the yarns that you're going to want to wear close to the skin. Um, those are going to be the ones you want to make those socks out of, those scarves out of. It can be spun into lace weight yarn, which drapes more around your neck. It's, it's something that you're going to welcome around your neck. Um, the coarser, so the higher the micron count, um, those coarser wools, they are still valuable. They are still good. You might not want to take it and rub it against your neck or make a sweater out of it, um, but those coarser wools can be used in rugs, in household items, um, in things that you would weave. Sometimes the, the, the coarser wools are more desirable for things like that. Uh, many consumers will still believe the myth. I hear it all the time at markets, all the time. Well, I don't like wool. Wool's too itchy. Um, think of those itchy sweaters your aunt used to make you for Christmas that you never wanted to wear and you threw in the corner or that you put in the washing machine and it became something for your teddy bear to wear. Those um, are, we're seeing a lot of that processed out of the finer wools and the finer wool yarns and fabrics that you're seeing in the stores. That it was, was cheaply and improperly um, used wool. So it was probably a coarser wool. They bought cheaper and tried to make a finer item out of it. 
um, but that doesn't have that doesn't have to happen. Um, you can you can match the wool to what you want to make out of it, and that's what a lot of our direct customers are doing. Um, they know what they want to make, they know how they want to make it, um, and they will find the wool and they will find the producer that is getting them the wool that they want. Uh, micron count or average fiber diameter is typically the best indicator of value, but it's not the only indicator of value. So fiber diameter can be estimated visually um, or it can also be sent off, it's a scientific measurement, can be sent off to a laboratory um, for objective measurement. Um, so those, when, when you're able to send your wool off to a lab to get tested for the micron count, um, people use that in their marketing. They use that to say it's been tested. This specific sheep tests at this micron count. This fleece tests at this micron count. Um, and that can be used as you market and as you sell your fibers. Some people are very specific about that. Some people just want to touch it. And if they like the touch of it, they like the feel of it, they're going to go with your, um, they're going to go with your fleece. Crimp, um, we're going to talk about crimp. Crimp is the natural waviness of, or the bend of the wool fiber. So when you look at wool, um, it'll have that natural zigzag to it. Um, that varies um, with the diameter of the fiber and can also be a predictor of the fineness. So those two things, crimp and your fiber diameter, often go together. Fine wools have more crimp than a coarser wool or a long wool. A long wool will almost look um, wavy. Uh, while your crimp on your merino or your rambouillet, you're almost not going to be able to see it. You'd almost have to get right up on it to see the crimp in your fiber. Yield is the amount of wool that is left after the washing or scouring process. It's usually expressed as a percentage of the original fleece weight or the grease weight. Um, a fleece in the grease is the fleece directly off the sheep, skirted, but it's still got that lanolin, that's that grease. It's got the lanolin, the dirt, the dust, bits of your farm, vegetable matter. Yield in wool is very, val is very, very, is qu excuse me, is quite variable and is affected by many factors, both genetic and environmental. So you might have two sheep on your farm, same age, same breed, but one sheep really likes to go sleep under your big oak tree, likes to get down in the leaves, likes to roll around in it. The other sheep, likes to lay in the open pasture. One sheep's fleece is gonna be heavier because it is full of garbage. It is full of leaves and dirt and dust and all the things um, that that sheep has picked up along the way. It might just be a messy eater. I have one sheep that looks constantly like he's got a beard of mess because he is a messy eater. He is gonna have a heavier um, yield of his fiber, excuse me, he's going to have less of a yield of his fiber because a lot of that's going to wash out and get skirted out and picked out than his twin sister who does not eat messily. She is a, a dainty eater and she sleeps in the middle of the pasture and she does not get down in the dirt like he does. So they're very much body types are similar, but he's going to have less weight when it's all washed and said and done than hers. Um, so your yield is what's left over after you wash your fiber. Uh, your color and your luster um, is in and itself a really good market um, for your wool's value. We're not going to talk a lot about commodity markets tonight, um, only because um, the wool pool that we have, for instance, we're not having one this year due to COVID, um, but uh, the commodity markets are the bulk markets where you send all of your wool of one color, you have to separate it out, it can't be blended together. You send those off um, to wool pools or other commodity markets that are in the area. Um, and those are, um, they, they give you less per pound, but you've had to do much less with it. You could also be selling it to your shear um, or just letting your shear take your wool when he's done. Um, again, you're probably not getting a lot of money from that wool, from those fleeces um, into your pocket. You, the more work you do to your fleece, the more money you take back in. So we're going to talk more about direct to, to customers such as hand spinners, knitters, weavers, um, things like that. Um, hand spinners and niche markets tend to prefer the uniqueness of each of your fleeces. Again, just like Dr. Renfro shared, you're selling your story. They want to know that sheep, if it has a name, they want to know that sheep's name. If your sheep doesn't have a name, 
make one up. Um, it's always a nice uh, addition just to give that little bit of personality to to one of your to one of your fleeces and to your sheep and to your farm. They want to know how you got started. They want to know how long you've been doing it. They want to know um, your your sheep's backstory. Um, I have one sheep in particular. His name is Oliver. He was my very first lamb ever born on the farm. He's a weather and he does nothing but eat and that's it. But his fleeces every year, I tell a little story about Oliver. And because I shared so many pictures when I was getting started and having my first lamb and making a big deal about him, I have people that want a hat. They want the 2020 Oliver hat and they know that that's gonna come off of his 2020 fleece. It's little things like that, that, that can make all the difference. When you're talking about back to color and luster of your um, fibers, you don't have to be as um, exact uh, as you would with a commodity market. You can't mix the colors. They want white only because white, uh, they, they'll have, correct me, Kelly, if I'm wrong, but I believe they do have areas that you can put in some natural colored wools, um, but at a lower cost, is that right? Right, so the, the preferred is gonna be white wools because they're easier to dye. That's less work they have to do on there in the process. Yeah. The black wools get discounted incredibly um, because again, they're not necessarily easy to dye, so. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. That's what, I, that's what I thought, but since I have not personally done a wool pool, I did not wanna misspeak either. Um, but yes, so even just the little bits of, of black hair that might be on your sheep's legs cannot get into that kind of wool or it'll be tossed out um, or you'll get less of a payback for it. Um, but like we're talking with our niche markets and with our, our small direct customers, they want a lot of that uniqueness. That's what they're looking for. Um, some hand spinners and artists would pay more for a uniquely colored Jacob fleece because it has patches of different colors and they have a specific project in mind for those specific colors than they would for a fine white fleece. You know, if it were um, a Rambouillet fleece, they might pay more because they're looking for a specific thing and they're looking for a specific project in mind. Luster um, is a little bit different in your color. Color also can include staining. So if a um, customer is looking for um, a pure white fleece, for instance, they, would, they might say they don't want the canary staining, the yellow staining that's on the tips sometimes of your fibers because that does not wash out. Um, so if they're gonna dye it, if they're gonna do other things with it, they might not care about the color. Um, if they're looking for something that has natural colors, different shading, I've um, heard of customers looking for specific spotted sheep that were gonna have multiple colors um, all throughout their fleeces. They want that because of what they can produce with un the uniqueness of the project that they're working on um, is, is going to be what they're looking for. Luster, if they're asking about the luster of a, of a fleece, the luster is that reflective shine. Um, long wools a lot of times will have this, the luster in their locks. Um, it will be um, almost have a reflective um, property to it, um, be very shiny. Um, some buyers will also ask about the fleece's handle, or if you pull a lock out, they pull a chunk of that fleece out, they want to know how it feels in your hand. Does it feel firm? Does it feel strong? Does it feel like you can hear the ping? They'll kind of pull it like this. Um, if they can hear the ping, that little like pop um, and not a crack, um, that that means that's going to be a really strong fleece. You want that ping when you're pulling your fleece apart. You don't want the crack or the snap. Um, the snap means that you've got some weak spots in your fleece and that might um, that might be a, 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 mute po a mute point for their, pro for their project. Staple length um, is measured from the base to the tip of unstretched fiber. And I put a little picture down there so you can see because I was having a hard time trying to describe what that is um, without you visually seeing it. Um, shorter staple lengths make spinning fiber a little bit more challenging for hand spinners because it just kind of pulls through your hands and they have to make it a much tighter, um, a much tighter spin to kind of get it to stick together. Um, but a felter or a fiber artist might be looking for shorter fibers. It might be right up their alley of what they're looking for. Um, the longer is usually the more desirable, anywhere from three to five inches. This one we're looking at is a Tunis um, piece, and that is about four inches staple length. 
And that would be a very good for a hand spinner. They're looking for that, um, again, looking for that strength, looking for that length. Um, and that's what they're going to be looking for when they're trying to buy a fleece from you. Uh, strength is another important uh, aspect of your staple length because you might have five inches, um, but like I said earlier with the long wools, if you've not sheared um, twice and say that you've got, a, a, some long wools get very, very long. If you have an eight inch staple length, but three of those inches are worthless because they're matted um, or they're felted together at the tips um, or full of canary staining, you wouldn't be able to sell that as well as you could have sold it had you sheared them twice that year. A, a four inch staple length is still gonna be better if it's clean, if it is um, unmatted, it, if it is free of vegetable matter, that's gonna be much more worth um, selling than something that is long, but is um, matted and, and dirty at the ends. Um, tender wool or wool with breaks. Um, again, we talked about this a little bit last night in the uh, nutrition. That shows up um, from stress in the animal, from poor nutrition, from um, even it can be ch changing changing your grain or your feed. Um, and they, the sheep just didn't like it. They didn't get what they were wanting. That can show up in the fleece. Um, under the, the pressure of processing, wool with significant weak spots or breakage points will be become unusable because the machines, if you send them to a, um, a processing mill or if you try to process it yourself, that wool will just break apart and it'll be just little bits and pieces and it's unusable at that point. You could probably felt it, um, but it was probably not going to be great for its intended use. You don't want your customer to try to process that fiber and have it fall apart on them. Um, as they're trying to process it. So different types of wool have different characteristics and uses. Knowing your breed, so I said know thy wool, know thyself, know thy wool. Um, get to know what your uh, breed is good for. Um, the wool characteristics that you are raising on your farm, even if you are raising dual purpose and the wool is just an afterthought, it still, again, has value and has people out there that are looking for that type of fiber. Hand spinners have different preferences on types and colors of wool that they spin. Um, they want to find unique color variations and they want to um, be, bre the specific breeds can be selling points for knitters and felters. Um, there was just recently an article um, about um, spinning with down fibers. So I, I raised baby doll South Downs and I had been told by a couple different spinners that they, that they just pretty much thought that my wool was mulch because it was too short and they didn't want to mess with too short a fiber. And baby dolls are known for having a short uh, fleece. But because of this article that specifically mentioned baby doll south down fiber, I've had a boon on people on the internet buying the, the baby doll south down wool because it also, down wools are resistant to water felting. They're um, resistant to um, felting in the wash. So because of looking at other reasons, other things that would make your wool desirable, you can find ways that even if somebody says, well, I really don't like your wool, that could just be a personal preference. There is somebody out there that is looking for your type of wool. So regardless of the type of wool preferred, all artists want clean wool. Cleanliness is important. It might not be godliness, but it is close. Um, it is free when you have clean wool. It's free from vegetable matter. It's free from dirt. Uh, it is free from bits and pieces of your farm. Keep your farm at home. Do not send your farm to your customers. Um, fleeces sold direct to, to customers um, need to be skirted at the very minimum. Nobody wants your sheep's poo being sent through the mail. Nobody wants that. Um, in finer wool breeds, it is common for the sheep to be covered and their fleeces um, stay cleaner that way. It minimizes the effects of weathering. It is costly to cover your sheep, um, but it might um, offset by the higher prices that you would receive for the fleeces. Um, it might be worth some of the headache of trying to pick your fleeces clean at the end of your season um, when you are trying to get those fleeces ready to sell or to process. Um, fleeces can be sold with very minimal processing. 
but there are ways, the more you put into your wool, the more work you put in on your end, the more money you can take out at the end. Um, the more you touch your wool, the more you process it down all the way to uh, roving, to um, batting, to yarn, to a finished product. You can charge more by the time you get to the finished product than you could have sold it at the very beginning for pennies to a commodity market or to uh, even just to sell it as a raw fleece. You're going to get more on the end, but that's again, time intensive. That's going to be what, how much, how much, how much of your personal time and your effort can you put into it? Um, send, uh, sending your fleeces to the local mill um, will take a lot of that work off your plate. Again, it's an investment. So you are going to be paying for the professional equipment, the workmanship, and for them to do large quantities of your wool um, that can be hard to recreate at home. It, it's going to be more intensive. You do not have the equipment they have. Um, if you've ever visited a wool mill, there's um, a few of them that are within a couple hours drive of central Kentucky. Um, I encourage you to go try to take a tour if you're able to um, when COVID is gone and you're able to get out again. Um, but these places, you can see all the different ways they can clean your fleece and why their fleece comes out so much cleaner than what you can do on your own um, with just a couple carding brushes. Um, many mills will reject fiber that is still heavily tagged. They're just not going to deal with it. Um, or they're going to charge you extra to clean it and to skirt your fiber for you. Um, again, it depends on if you're willing to take in that extra cost or possibly take that wool back home or pay shipping costs back to you if you've sent, sent them overly soiled um, fiber. Uh, many mills do offer a la carte options, so they will do as much of the processing or as very little of the processing as you want. You can have them just scour it, and send it back to you just clean, and then you can take it from there. They can go all the way to plying yarn or making a finished item like a blanket or scarf or hat or socks. Again, it depends on how much money you want to invest on the front end and how much you hope to reap back on the end. Uh, minimum weight requirements when you are asking them to do a run of yarn um, may come into uh, play. They might need, there's a couple local meals that I know of that want at least 40 pounds of fiber to do a yarn run. So it depends on how much you have to give them. If you send them a few fleeces, three or four fleeces, and you say, I'd like a run of yarn on this, you're probably not going to get that. Um, you might be able to find a local spinner that would do that for you, um, at, again, at a cost. Um, but it's just something you're going to have to look for um, how much time or how much money you want to invest um, and what you expect to get back out of it at the end. Uh, there are different um, wool products, finished wool products that can be directly marketed to customers or retailers, garments, outerwear, rugs, bedding. Um, it's just all out there. There's so many options once you get your wool processed. Knowing what finished item your wool is best for, and know, back to knowing yourself, knowing your wool, knowing your story, um, is going to help you to best decide how much processing you want to do. If you don't know what your fleece is worth, Find somebody who is a fiber artist, who is a knitter in your life, who is a spinner, a hand spinner. If you don't have any of those people around you, find your local yarn store. There are still local little yarn shops that are all over Kentucky. Um, go in, find one, let them know that you are a local wool producer and that you'd just like to have somebody play with some of your wool. That is the fastest way to get a fiber artist friend is to say, I have fiber for you. Would you try it out? Um, and just trade, trade some of their time um, for some of your wool and see if they can give you some more ideas on what your wool is good for. Um, if they have any uh, feedback they could give you, that is going to be priceless in the end to know what your wool can be used for, what they think of it. Um, and this might open up just a whole new avenue for you of how to market your wool and give you more ideas. So hopefully that will help you guys. And I think that is it for me tonight. Thank you so much, Sir Beth. A couple of questions, just um, two quick ones that came in. So the first one, is there any market for hair that is shed from hair sheep? That is a really good question and not the first time I have heard it. Um, 
I don't know specifically right now, the thing about um, hair versus wool is that the hair does not have a crimp to it. So when people are spinning, you can spin anything. I have been asked to spin dog hair before. So you can spin anything. Um, I put a really high cap on spinning pet fiber and especially if the pet is deceased, I draw the line somewhere. But the, um, the thing about um, hair versus wool is that that crimp, um, each of those fibers are barbed. So that individual fiber that we were talking about, um, looking at the, the fineness of the wool, those are, are, they're microscopically barbed. So that is what helps the fiber to grab onto one another and to hold while you're spinning it and pulling it. Hair does not have that. Um, wool also has a memory that's part of that crimp and that wool that once you put the spin in it, once you put that spin into the fiber, um, it grabs onto one another and it remembers where it's at. That's why wool fiber isn't kind of poofy everywhere. It stays in that rope, in that twisted space. Um, you could not take your own hair and spin it and expect that it would just stay that way. So that is where the drawback of hair um, is. Um, also collecting it might be a little bit more of an issue um, than sharing all comes in one space, um, comes off in one, usually in one big piece. Um, at least that's the hope and desire. Um, but there might be ways that you could find um, people that would, would want to. You can always try to see if there's a market for in your area to see if, if there's something you could do for it. I don't know right off the top of my head any specific ways that are looking for hair from hair sheep, though. Thank you. Great. And then the second question is, there a local market for pelts? Should someone try to get these back from the processor? Um, yeah, there are. I mean, you can, there, there's just about um, anything that you would want to try to sell to, to retain the value. Um, there is markets for pelts. You have to be careful where you market them. Um, I know specifically there's been a crackdown on Facebook, and we are going to talk about more of places and how and spaces to sell your fiber tomorrow. Um, but there are um, some limitations on how to sell um, animal uh, byproduct. I don't know what to really call it um, on Facebook Marketplace specifically. And also I believe some on Etsy um, and some other of the online markets um, just to reduce what they feel, um, sorry about my air quotes, what they feel could be um, animal abuse. And I know that that is not what you're doing with your animals. Um, and I, I fully believe in using as much of them as we can. Um, but to where people who are outside of our industry don't have the understanding or education to know um, more of what we're doing, that sometimes that comes off differently. So there's been a lot of crackdown on, there's hard, there's some places that you can't even on Facebook marketplace even sell fleeces because people in their heads think that it's something else or that there's cruelty involved, which we know in our industry we know is not. So um, you just have to be careful about where you, where you sell those. Un unlike um, what Dr. Renfro shared with the USDA and, and the um, regulations, there's not a lot of regulations on um, wool products. Um, in Canada, you will come across a lot more um, of the regulations of labeling and, and things that you have to include, um, but not in America. We don't have that. Um, and so we don't, um, we don't have a lot of instruction. It's basically based where you market that kind of sets the rules um, for where you can sell those. But there is a market. I know that was a very long answer for yes, there is a market for pelts. If you can get them back um, and they are in a, a way that you can can try to sell them, whether they're tanned already or you want to tan them yourself, there, there is markets for, for those pelts. Thank you. Great. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to Brent Lackey's presentation. I think we had another question come in, but we'll just try to answer that via text as we, as we go. Okay. Thanks, Olivia. Um, 
appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak tonight. I'm going to go over just kind of the basics you need to think about and when you're doing a business plan or your go and sheet operation and depending on the whatever product you're looking at. Go ahead, next slide, Olivia. Um, the first step, no matter what type of operation you're looking at, I always tell people is focus on what are your goals, you know, and really be specific and, and put a lot of thought into what your goals are and really focus on what your targets are. Um, and once you understand and, and, and try to set specific goals that, that can be measured so you can go back and hold yourself accountable. Am I reaching these goals? And also with those goals, be very focused and pursue those goals. Dream big, have those specific goals in place. And, and if, if a decision comes up that doesn't, it doesn't help you meet that goal, discard it. You know, <clears throat> be very goal centered in what you do because, you know, in any operation, you're going to have lots of things to come your way that can distract you from getting where you want to get to. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we always encourage people to do when they start, first start getting into a marketing plan is to do some market research and analysis. You know, first you want to, you know, in, in, you want to identify what are some trends in the marketplace? What are some things that are impacting your business that you need to know about that positively or negatively going forward? You know, if you're talking about marketing local um, lamb or sheep, what about the local food movement? What about the different de the demographics in the different marketplaces? Um, what, what about food safety? What, what, how important is that? Um, Understand what your markets are, understand the demographics that are there, understand how there's been changes and what impact that has to be. And then also understand who your competitors are out there. What are their strengths? Um, what, what's their reputation known for? Um, what, what territories do they cover? Understand your competitors as well as you can be so you can understand that where, you, where your position place in the marketplace is. Next slide. Um, Oh, before I get too far into tar target customers, and one thing also in market research, it can be, there's various sources you can find for market research. We you know it's a lot easier today than it was 30 years ago with Google and things like that to do stuff, but also doing in-person market research of just, you know, going into the stores that, that are selling lamb or, or goat or sheep or goat products and seeing how they're displayed, what people are thinking about it. And a lot of times we'll play, um, you know, secret shopper in places and just hang out. I know at one time we were talking, I had a client who was thinking about making goat cheese and we hung out, hung out to go at the cheese section of Good Foods Co-op one day for about 45 minutes. And I talked to five or six people as they came through, which was easier in pre-COVID days and COVID environment now. And I just simply asked the question, hey, what, why are you getting that cheese? You know, and, and I got to learn why people were thinking about it. And it was amazing how much people knew about the farms that they were buying from you know and that was one of the reasons they would say is they would say well i'm buying this because of you know this farm and they've been they've been in, this is a, it's a third generation farm da, 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 or they this so it's important to understand that your story is an important part and that market research can help you with that um, next is your, is your target customers it's important to know who are who are most likely most likely people to buy my products you know, who are they and how can, you know, what are their needs? Um, what's their ability to purchase and what's their willingness to purchase? You know, if, if your target audience is a, you know, and also how they, and how they make decisions. Um, understand, you know, if you were talking, if your target audience is a, you know, is, is families with household, edu you know, they're a college educated, where are those people shop? What kind of convenience, what's important to them? Sometimes convenience is more important to them than, than price. Understanding those things, you know, it could be the product, what's important to that customer. Um, are you talking about retail customers or wholesale customers? Um, you know, if it's a wholesale customer, if you're talking about a restaurant, for say, then you want to make sure that when you contact them, what's important to them is having a constant flow. Of, they, they'll, they'll buy small bites of the apple constantly. They want that constant um, supply, but they also want to make sure that you contact them at the right time and know what they want to have. Also, what do, what do these customers value? What's important to them? How do they make decisions? Think about this as you're, as you're understanding, it's so important to understand who your customer is because then that really helps you target A, what's your product or service, how it fits that niche, 
how you're going to price things and how you're going to promote your product. Um, next slide. Um, products and services. You need to know, understand what your product is and, and also but not just say that I sell lamb, but what are the key features of your lamb? You know, what makes it unique? Is it local? Is it going to be fresh or frozen? Is it organic produced? Is it your farm name? You know, is it what is what are the features that you, that you're offering? Is it we're offering retail cuts or is it we're offering whole freezer lamb? You know, what are those specific things that you're offering that, that are key features? And then also understand what are the benefits your product is offering and how is that customer going to benefit from buying your product versus somebody else's product. You know, if, if, you, if your customer really values, you know, supporting local farms and you don't know that, if they really value grass fed, if they value these the different things, you want to make sure that you are highlighting that and understanding, you have to understand, you need to understand what benefits your product is offering for the consumer so you can better market that product. Um, Pricing, you know, um, pricing is a critical part of marketing, and I often say it's kind of a, there's an art and a science to it. You know, um, you you always want to be delicate with your pricing that you don't price yourself out of the marketplace by putting the price too high, but you also want to put it too low. So there, you have to understand there's a kind of an art to it, but there's also a science around it because you want to make sure that you're covering your cost, and there's ways you can do some research and analysis to make sure that your product you're pricing it way you know um you can be thinking about what are you you know in things in the science form is what are your competitors pricing their product for what is your cost of production for that product how much does it cost you to get that product to the marketplace um how much are consumers willing to pay for this product you know if you see that there are similar products on the shelf at a certain price you don't go well they're willing to pay is this even though i thought i could do it cheaper than that if they're willing to pay that then you can do that um those you know those, just different things that you want to think about when you're doing your pricing it's also important that you are consistent your pricing is consistent with how you're marketing your product if you are marketing your product as a it's a premium product that it should have that, that offers a lot of value to it and it's almost a luxury good then or, you know it's a premium product well then your product shouldn't be the cheapest shouldn't be cheaper your lamb then shouldn't be cheaper than what they can buy it at save a lot or whatever you know the local, local grocery store your product should be higher than the generic you know that walmart price how you price your product will provide a establishes your reputation you know, if you're if you want to be if you want to be a premium product, you know, that price is there. If, you, if it's low price, and that can send a mixed message to the consumer. Um, some key considerations in pricing. We've gone over some of these: your cost of production, competition. Let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, after you've understood who your customers are, what the key benefits of your products are. And how you're going to price it then you need to develop your sales and promotion strategies and those really need to be developed based on who your target customer is um, and, and what your goals are and what your expected sales are um, you know those those promotion tactics can include am i going to use a website or am i going to use social media um, social media is a great way that is, is becoming a more and more important prevalence in our society it's, you know, it's a great way of getting, of controlling your message to your targeted customer base at a very low, a very low rate. Radio or print advertising, you know, you know, and understanding what type of radio stations do your customers listen to, if that's the route you're going to go. What type of signage do you need? Are you going to go to certain events to market your product? What type of printing materials are you going to use? Um, another thing to consider is are you going to have a have you going to have a dedicated person who's selling your product you need to hire a salesperson or do you have the right personality yourself to, and, and the time to be the dedicated salesperson because it does take time to develop those relationships and to check in on customers you know just because you talk to the buyer at a store and they say yeah we'd be interested in buying your product doesn't mean you made a sale or and once you make your first sale, doesn't mean they're going to constantly come back to you. You've got to continue to work that relationship and build that relationship. Next slide. Um, some different social media things to consider. Facebook, you know, is a very broad audience. 
become kind of pretty commonplace in our society today. You know, the thing is to consider is that, you know, it is a social platform, you know, so that always take that in consideration. Make sure that you, your posts are relevant to, to your audience. Um, try to make, you know, you don't want to be in constant promotion mode with your post. You know, you want to, you want, Facebook allows you to tell your story. And what part of your story do you want to sell? Also, you want to have a regular presence on Facebook. The more, the more often there is an algorithm to it, the more often you post, the more likely you're going to have your posts are going to be seen through them. Also, um, you know, think, think, consider things like going live. That, that helps you go to the top of somebody's news feed and th doing things like that are to consider with your Facebook page. Next slide. Um, Instagram, you know, post with a location gets 79% more engagement. Um, Instagram is a very, for, the, for the, your younger audience, especially those younger than me in their 20s and 30s, they're much more likely to use Instagram than Facebook. Um, you know, the videos sometimes get a lot more engagement. Um, we, there's been research to show that the best time to post are, are around lunchtime or just after dinner. Um, you don't want to post in the middle of the afternoon. You know, that's something that you, things that you want to consider. Um, after you've kind of figured out your marketing plan, you know, how, what who your customers are, um, how you're going to price it, what your products are, how you're going to promote it, then you do need to think about, okay, how am I going to manage it? What are my operations going to look like? Um, some key things to consider is what's the ownership structure? Who are the owners involved? Um, are we, do we need to be legally organized? If we are, what legal organization or do we need to be in to protect ourselves? What's our key personnel? What person, you know, how many personnel do we need? What, what are the key jobs and roles that need to happen for us to, to carry out our, you know, our, our business and what personnel is there? Um, how much how much are we going to pay these people? How much training do they need? Finally, what are your facility and equipment needs? Um, do you need to have them or can you use third party people? You know, what, what third party sources do you need to have that can provide that? And finally, understanding your production process. You want to know, you want to plan that out so you understand it so you can carry forth throughout the year to make sure that you're following your plan and that you've thought about everything before you get started to make sure you understand what you're getting into. Um, that planning process can pays, you know, because sometimes there will be hiccups in the, in the road and you go, well, we weren't thinking about this or you know, we had a point where we, we knew there might be a problem and that, this is how we're going to address that problem. Okay, next slide. Um, financials. Um, you know, with, with any part of business plan, you need to have some type of financial projections. One of the key things is if you're if you're doing something new, what are those startup or expanding startup costs going to be? Or if you're expanding, what's that expansion cost going to cost me? What's it going to cost to get in business? Also, you want to look at um, income statement and cash flow projections, which kind of helps you understand how much income you're going to make. And that cash flow projection, you sometimes want to look at what I call monthly cash flow to understand if there's a lot of, if there's some seasonality in your business, which probably in most agricultural business there are, to understand that there might be times of the year where your cash flow is really low or negative. So you might need to have a line of credit and then a balance sheet projection. Next slide. Um, some basics on these financial statements that you want to have is a budget. And you know, this kind of helps you plan out what you plan to earn and spend. And then you want to compare that to what you actually earn and spend. And then that, that really helps you plan going forward. Um, your income statement is kind of captures the, the activity, of, measures the performance of your business over a period of time. Um, most small farms use what they call a cash system. It's based on income and expenses are recorded as you receive the cash or spend the cash. Accrual accounting is when you, you record income when you make the sale, not necessarily when you get the check or deposit the check, for example. Some key items to include in your income statement are sales, um, your cost of the goods sold, which is the cost it takes you to physically make that sale, cost you would not incur without producing and selling that product, operating expenses, and then your net incomes at the bottom. Your balance sheets kind of measures the, the value of your business at a point of time. What it does is it lists out 
your assets, your current assets such as cash and inventory and fixed assets like land, buildings, equipment, what you own and then what you owe. What are your liabilities? What's your credit card bill? What's your line of credit? Um, other accounts payable? What, how much long-term liabilities do I have? And then, and then you should have some equity hopefully at the bottom. And the key thing of the balance sheet is assets should equal your liabilities plus your equity. And in a cash flow statement, it measures only cash transactions, um, which is slightly different from income statement because of income statement, like for example, your loan payment on an income statement, you only look at your interest. You don't talk about the actual principal payment. Whereas in the cash flow statement, you're looking at the whole loan payment as a, as a ca cash outflow. Next slide. And like I said, you know, it's really important for, you know, we think for ag businesses and for farm producers to really look at estimating a monthly cash flow. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just important to figure it out. But you also want to make sure you're putting as much good information, information as you can, as, as the old saying is garbage in, garbage out. Um, next slide. You know, and understand with those monthly cash flow, you kind of want to understand what your sources are of funds, when you're most likely to receive money, when are you going to make sales, when are you going to, you know, or if you're going to take out a line of credit, when's that going to happen, and then when are your different expenses going to be? You know, and with production agriculture, lots of times you have a lot of expenses early on before you actually get to sell that product. And you look at it on a monthly basis to see is there a lean time during the year where I pot potentially have no money in the bank. And what am I going to do to take care of that? You know, and also, are there, it helps you also prepare for, okay, I need to also make sure I've got at least this amount of money in there in case something unexpected happens. That's kind of what the monthly cash flow should do for you. Um, one thing I'm briefly go over is you want to make sure that you've thought about how am I going to, what type of financial records am I going to keep and how am I going to do it? Um, the key thing is, keep good records and try to be better at keeping records every year. Um, you wanna have a dedicated place for your records and you want a system that makes sense for your business. Your system might not make sense for somebody. Now, hopefully it's not just a shoebox, but you wanna make sure that you've got some type of system that you understand and that when, it, when key things come up that you can re easily refer back to that system and find that key record that you need to find. You want efficiencies in, in there. Um, you want to have different files or boxes or binders for different types of, for, for various systems, you know, in your record keeping. You want to definitely organize things by year. You want to do it by types of records. You know, lots of times we, some businesses would like to say by vendor, by buyer. You want to have personnel records. It depends on your business. But have some type of organizational system that you understand that you can always refer back to. Next slide. Um, and the final thing that I want to talk about when you're doing a business plan is, how are you going to measure yourself? Um, if you don't, if you don't evaluate yourself or evaluate the people in your business, you're never giving yourself or those people a chance to grow. You really need to understand how you're going to measure success, what you, what, what success means to you. And you want to have some key performance measures that are important to you to figure out that, that guide you on that success. Um, and it also, it's important that you go back to those key measures and monitor them on a regular basis. Some of them might be on a weekly basis. Some of them might be on a monthly, some of them just yearly, but have some type of tool that you refer back to so you understand what those are. Um, th those measures could be your number of customers. It could be, if you're running a retail business, number of transactions, your sales per transaction. Um, it could be, you know, you know, there's various lamb and goat production records, I'm sure that you that you want to keep track of. And then also, you know, having that sales forecast and, and, and really measuring your actual sales versus what you thought your sales were going to be. Having those evaluation methods are, are just, you, you have to grade yourself. You have to evaluate yourself. If you're not, you're never really going to grow and never really move that business forward. Next slide. Um, I think that wraps it up. I hope I didn't go too fast, but I wanted to try. I want to just cover some highlights quickly. Um, one thing to know is at KCARD, we are here to help. We do business planning and we help set financial record keeping and we can help you find markets. Um, we've got a lot of great people at work. Please don't feel free to reach out to me or Olivia or somebody else on staff. So, Thanks so much, Brent. That was great.
Um, we did have one question come in. I don't, um, that question came in when you were mentioning being in Good Foods Marketplace. So I'm not sure if that's what the question is about. How does she go about finding that market? If you're not familiar, um, Good Foods Co-op is a natural food store and co-op um, retail grocery in Lexington, Kentucky. You can find it online. But if you need assistance finding a market for your product that is not Good Foods Marketplace, um, we can help you do that. So just reach out um, to us. So I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, and, and be in touch with us if you would like to. Now is a great time to get started on a business plan. We've got all winter before um, the start of the new year and new records. So um, be in touch with us if that's something you could use help with. Um, all right, we're going to wrap up if um, Sarah Beth, if you, or sorry, um, Kelly, if you'd like to talk about the new um, resources online. Sure. So Sarah Beth can do it too. She can knock that out of the park. So if you liked all the stuff that you heard tonight, I have great news for you. Not only will you get the replay of this webinar, but you can find all of that information on this new direct marketing resource that we have on our website. You can actually access that from our homepage. You can go directly to this link, or you can go to the marketing uh, resources tab at the top of our website. But you'll notice that this resource focuses on the processing, the economics, and the marketing of direct marketing sheep and goat products. Okay, so the processing is going to cover meat and fiber processing. Economics is the pricing. Okay, and there is a, an Excel calculator in there that you can download and you can put in your cost and it will calculate for you the cost of your meat per pound or per carcass. And that will help you like, for instance, like to compare to other producers or make sure that you're not undercutting yourself by not charging enough. Um, if you're charging too much and people are paying it, keep going, okay? But that calculator will help you figure that out. And then the marketing page is, is a great list of resources. It's got videos on there too, and it can help you with your marketing research. It can help you trying to find your customers. It really defines what the different marketing outlets are um, and the benefits of those. So definitely go check out this website. I hope you guys really like it, and we'll be continuing to update that all along the way, but I'm super excited about this one. So. All right, with that, um, we will go ahead and close out the night. Again, just a reminder, we'll be back here for one more night tomorrow night to talk about um, sales and marketing again of meat and fiber products. So really great to have everyone on tonight. Um, reach out to us if you have questions. Thank you so much for all of the presenters for uh, joining us on the evening. And we will uh, catch you back tomorrow evening. Thanks.